Okay, thank you very much, and just say thank you to the PWI for uh, uh, allowing me to talk today. Uh, I'm the Atkins Professor for High Speed Rail uh, at Harriet Watt University. And I've kind of changed the title a little bit. Uh, I also want to look a little bit at peak particle velocities uh, in the ballast structure, because it starts to define the point at which you should look at ballast, and perhaps the point you should start looking at slab. In terms of the topics that we'll cover, we'll look at, well, setting the context, uh, the role of peak particle velocity within the ballast structure, modelling of leads guard. Uh, some may have seen me talk about leads guard before, but it's a good way to uh, calibrate your models. And then we'll look at some observations of track form, strengthening, critical speeds, and uh, the role of slab track in looking at the critical speed issue. And then we'll have a few concluding remarks. So setting the context. Well, when you're looking at uh, ballast or slab, what is the evaluation process? There's lots of things, of course, but some of the things are what are the constraints and risks, life cycle costs, we've heard a lot about this this morning, loading and environmental conditions, track form issues, and when I talk about ballast, I'm going to talk about unmodified ballast. So ballast in its pure form, if you like. No reinforcement in it, no geogrids, no polymers, no nothing. Just ordinary ballast. Perhaps look at the uh, maintenance issue for that. We've heard some of that this morning. And then with the concrete slab, there's ground movements, uh, cracking, and so on. So there's lots of things that we need to look at. But today, I want to concentrate on some of the dynamics. Uh, there's been a few equations already this morning, so I don't feel too bad. Uh, what we need to look at with dynamics, there's compression waves, the shear waves. I'm sure we'll hear a little bit more about that with the vibration. The one I'm interested in is the Rayleigh wave. And we'll talk a little bit about how that affects the track and how sites start to respond once the train speeds increase. Uh, this is a, an extract from a paper uh, which we wrote last year. There are lots of different parameters that can be used to look at issues to do with Rayleigh waves and critical speeds. The one which I'll refer to today are these two here. And I'll refer to that as the critical ratio, which is the train speed divided by some value of critical velocity. Now, the critical velocity can be just ballast in its pure form. It could be ballast which is reinforced. It could be the ground which is reinforced. It could be an embankment. The critical speed will just refer, the critical ratio, sorry, will just refer to the train speed divided by a critical speed. Lots of others can be looked at in terms of characteristic train uh, track wavelengths and all sorts of things. They can come in uh, when you have more time to look at that. So the role of peak particle velocity. Now, I could have looked at lots of different studies. There's not a huge amount out there, actually, in terms of the peak particle velocity around the track structure. There's quite a lot in terms of vibration to the uh, boundaries, but there's not a huge amount in terms of what is happening underneath the sleeper. So, and I borrowed a couple of slides from a colleague of mine, David Connolly, who's here today in the audience. Uh, David. Um, what we're interested in, if you look at vibration attenuation, this is the kind of thing that uh, uh, David looks at in terms of the vibration attenuation with distance. Today, I'm interested in what's happening right here. So what is happening underneath the track just here? That's what I'm interested in. And when I talk about particle velocities, that's where I'm going to look at. So this is an extract of a paper that was written back in 2004. And I've used this because it's talking about the German lines. And uh, some of the work that we'll look at in terms of the German standard fits in quite nicely. So this is a plot of the vibration speed in the ballast, the peak particle velocity, versus the train speed. And what we notice here is here is the peak particle velocity, uh, and this is, say, this is underneath the, the sleeper, increasing as the train speed increases. Well, that's a natural thing to do. As the train's getting faster, the sleeper's moving down, it's pushing ballast down as it goes through. So you'd expect that. Now, we can start to infer lots of things from this. I can draw a line, which is just a straight line, and say, look, there's lots of points up here. So I can draw a line which goes through the kind of root mean square value of that. Or is it starting to do this? Is the straight line here, and we're starting to see a sudden rise as we're hitting around 250 kilometers per hour. Don't really know, to be honest. There's not enough data points. The main point, though, is what is actually happening in terms of its value. Whether it's doing that or whether it's doing that, 
it is passing 20 millimeters per second as a vibration speed. Work that was done in Germany prior to that indicated that once you were passing 18 to 20 millimeters per second in the vibration uh, of the ballast, you would start to cause ballast migration. The ballast is starting to vibrate. We'll look at some of the studies that were done in France as well as we go through the presentation. I should point out at this stage that this is the kind of structure that was being uh, measured, but I'm unsure whether the EV2 value was 45 or 60, unsure at this particular time. But it's quite clear in that we are starting to pass the 20 millimeters per second once the vibration, once the train speed was at over 250. So in terms of things which affect peak particle velocity, there's lots of them. And we'll I'll produce a little equation which has some of the parameters in. Notice here that what has happened is this is the effect of the pad. So the, the stiffness of the pad has been made a lot uh, softer. And we see that the vibration speed of the ballast has reduced below the 20 millimeters per second. There are other implications, of course, of using soft pads. And we've heard about some of those this morning. The point is, is that the, the peak particle velocity is a function of many things. On the right hand side here are acceleration measurements taken uh, in France with the TGV. And we notice here that once we've reached 300 kilometers per hour, this was an accelerometer that was placed about 150 millimeters below sleeper bottom, the acceleration level is exceeding 1.4 G. Now, if we have extended accelerations of 1 G or above, and the ballast is on the surface, the ballast will start to lift because its acceleration is greater than gravity. So, but that depends on the length at which the acceleration is acting. But of course, if you have high ballast accelerations and you have a train going across generating wind, the uh, propensity for ballast flight, of course, becomes much greater. This was work that we published back in 2012. The work was done actually before 2012, but we published the work where we plotted what we've termed the critical ratio. Here is the critical ratio against particle velocity. Now this is done from a numerical simulation. And we plotted the critical ratio against peak particle velocity for a subgrade stiffness of about 25 megapascals. And what we saw was that once you got to a critical ratio of about 0.6, the peak particle velocity started to exceed 20 millimeters per second. Now, we plotted the critical curves for that in terms of the dynamic deflection divided by the static deflection. And you're finding, again, that you start to get dynamic effects occurring once your critical speed, critical ratio, was, a, was passing 0.6. So here is work, and this is uh, some plots that David has produced for me, of critical uh, velocity. So this is an analytical technique, and here we can see this is above critical speed and this is below critical speed. And we see these cones being generated above the critical speed. This is because the Rayleigh waves are all butting up against each other. And then at the bottom here is below the critical speed. And we'll look at this in terms of leads guard, and we'll see pre- and post-treatment, and I'll show you the animations for those. Okay, so returning back to the peak particle velocity, we can see that the peak particle velocity is a function of things like axial loads, stiffnesses of the rail, the ground, the pad, the train speed, the critical ratio, and so on. <coughs> Regardless of where that peak particle velocity was coming from, the data that which was being presented in those research papers, and remember it's research papers, was suggesting that once you got above 20 millimeters per second, potentially, I mean, the train's not going to fall off the track or anything silly like that. It just means that your maintenance level may start to increase. The recent work, and I saw the publication for this, was looking at the acceleration level within the ballast, which was suggesting once the ballast acceleration level exceeded 0.75 G, the ballast would actually start to destabilize. And that was work which came out of Germany. Uh, Bresslinger is the, the author who did that, where they had a shake table, they had a sleeper on the top, they were cyclically loading and shaking the ballast at the same time to generate a ballast acceleration. It's an idealized <coughs> test, but what they recommended was that the ballast acceleration should actually not exceed 0.35 G. 
And that was the recommendation from their work. This is work, and uh, I know that the PowerPoint presentation will be made available in terms of PDF, I think, after the conference, but you will not have that figure in it. Uh, this is unpublished work. I gave a talk in China about a month or so ago, and the Chinese had been looking at acceleration levels on slab track, and they had run through their testing processes, and what they found for the particular slab they were testing in the particular conditions they were testing, they found the same increase. And what they found is past 300 kilometers per hour, there was a sudden increase in the slab acceleration level. Now, the equations on the left-hand side here will give you the settlement of slab track. So you can use those equations and you can predict slab track settlement. But the point here is, and this will be published, I think, within a year, uh, depending on the peer review process, was that I calculated where that point was uh, when I was at the conference. And again, it's about a ratio of about 0.6, estimating what the critical speed was for the slab. So it is occurring in the slab as well as the ballast. Modeling of the leads guard, pre-treatment, and we do this because it's a well-established site which has been uh, analyzed and it acts as a calibration check for the codes. This is on the Gothenburg to Malmo line, which was uh, experiencing critical velocity. And notice you have three meters of material before you actually get to the organic clay. One and a half meters of embankment, granular material, the crust material, and then you get to the organic clay. The organic clay was the issue. It was that that was causing the critical velocity problem. This is the track response that you got. So this is the quasi-static response at a low speed giving about four millimeters quasi-static displacement. Once you increase the speed, then you are getting a resonant type behavior with peak to peak, peak to peak displacements of 25 millimeters, track deflections of 25 millimeters at the critical speed, peak to peak. There are all sorts of things happening here, which we're looking at, all sorts of things, which I don't have time to, to cover. I traveled uh, over two uh, Norway and Sweden, and picked up what the peak particle velocities were uh, recorded from that site. So here is a plot, and I've called it interpolated because I had to pick it off from the actual measurement data and the time histories. Here is peak particle velocity against lateral distance. And again, it's around here I'm interested in because that's where the ballast is. In this particular case, because the quasi-static displacements were very large, it meant that the peak particle velocity had already exceeded the 20 millimeters per second when the critical ratio was 0.5 because there was very high, uh, at low speed, there were still very high deflections. And remember, the peak particle velocity is a function of many things. The point is, though, as soon as I approached some critical ratio uh, greater than 0.5, we can see this increasing dramatically. And in fact, once you start to get to the critical speeds, it starts to get close to what we predicted many years beforehand. So modeling LEDSGARD post-treatment. So we've done the analysis for LEDSGARD to, to calibrate the models. All sorts of things you have to be wary of when modeling these types of things. All sorts of things you need to be wary of. The problem, one of the main problems, is that when you're modeling these behavior, as soon as you're approaching critical speed, you're right away into nonlinear behavior. It is very difficult then to predict what the reduction in your stiffness needs to be at the appropriate speeds. Switching to nonlinear, which automatically reduces stiffness as a critical speed is approached, is the way forward. It's the way to do it. Uh, here is the shear wave measurements, but what of interest is here. This is the normalized shear modulus against the dynamic shear strains. And we can see that once we start to develop dynamic shear strains, this uh, normalized shear modulus is dropping quite dramatically. And in fact, in the, cross, in the embankment, it was estimated there were a 50 to 60% reduction in shear modulus at critical speed compared to the quasi-static response. Uh, we model this nonlinear. You can use very complicated models. And my background is kinematic elastoplastic models and all this type of stuff but it takes such a long time to run. So if you're looking at 3D analysis, which is, I think is the way forward for this, then it becomes very difficult to use very advanced plasticity-based models. So in this particular case, we've done non-linearing, but all we're doing is modifying the resilient modulus 
based on things like isotropic pressure and, and deviatoric uh, stress and so on. Uh, it's also nonlinear in terms of damping. But already, with a simple nonlinear elastic model, we're up at six to seven material parameters per layer. So it's already starting to get a bit complicated. Uh, some of the kinematic models I worked with had 24 material parameters, to give you an idea. So here is a plot, and the, the solid line is the simulated response, the dashed line is the measured response. It's not too bad, using the nonlinear model. The point here is I'm not changing the parameters to go from one speed to another. All I'm doing is changing the speed. I could get slightly better responses by increasing the damping properties, for example. Frequency contents are modelled quite well, so we know we're okay. The important thing here is I've now plotted Young's modulus against time for a specific point in the track structure, and we can see that the crust area here, for example, we can see that the stiffness is reducing by about 50% as you approach critical speed. Again, justifying the need to look at nonlinear models if you were looking at critical velocity. We can see damping levels increasing quite dramatically as well. So this is an animation of the Leadsguard site. And what you can see here, these are Rayleigh waves propagating outwards. And you can start to see the mat cones here, as I define them as ground mat cones coming out. And this is what gives you this kind of resonant uh, behavior. And that's no mitigation. There's no mitigation applied to that. These were the critical velocity plots which we uh, published. The scatter in the data, they're from different sites, there are scatter in the data, but the overall trend is there. Is here is the critical speed, the critical speed ratio of 0.6. We start to see at about 0.5, we start to see some dynamic effect, but it really starts to kick off once we exceed about 0.6 of the critical speed, uh, critical speed ratio, sorry. And this is plotted against dynamic versus static displacements. Uh, what we see again is this envelope. And notice that the envelope, we don't have a lot of data on this side, but notice that the response starts to reduce past the critical speed. We can do lots of things with this, and I've normalized it in different ways. And on the right-hand side is the dynamic only component of the track response normalized. Uh, and what we see here is quite clearly the envelope which is being developed. And again, we don't have a lot of data past critical speed, but what we see is this envelope quite clearly defined. And there is a bit of scatter, as we can see in the results. Those two are two points for trains travelling in different directions. One travelling that way, same train, stops, comes back, and gave a slightly different response because of differences in axial sequencing. Observations. So what we've done is calibrated it, and I think what is of interest now is how does it relate to things going forwards. So with Leadsguard here, this is what they did to sort the critical mitigation. These are lime and cement columns along the side, and so it's like a ladder structure, and these are all on top of each other. Some of them going down 13 metres, others 6 to 7 metres. How far should we go? And I'll show you a way by which you can derive that. So this is, this is the FE analysis we set up. These are the line and cement columns. This has been taken, this slice here is across that midsection just there. Uh, hopefully you can see those. There's the, the line and cement columns coming down. Uh, I've got to publish this. I haven't got around to writing it up yet. This is the effect of the mitigation strategy through the line and cement columns. And we can see the mat cones and Rayleigh, Rayleigh waves and all that kind of things disappeared. It solved the problem. This is uh, cutting across that section and looking at it in the longitudinal direction. And we can see it's gone towards the quasi-static response, which is what we were looking for. This is the results of the analysis. So again, this is what we had before. That is it after mitigation. So that's with the Lyman cement columns in. Notice there's a slight difference in the scale. So this is actually even smaller. And I've blown it up between these levels here to show that you're getting a quasi-static response. And what we see here is post-treatment, and that is pre-treatment. So it's worked very well. But how far should you go? How far should you stabilise? This is work, uh, again, I've picked up from David. And this is work which is looking at dispersion curve analysis. So this is 
uh, the soil dispersion curve for what is happening in the soil. This is the dispersion curve for the upper trap structure. Where they meet gives you the critical velocity. David can tell you all about this. This is his work, uh, if you want to speak to him. What we can do, though, is that if we increase the soil stiffness, then this line increases, hence the critical velocity increases. If we do the same with the track dispersion curve, the upper track structure, again, we can get it to move up. Or, of course, we can do both. We can have a stiffer structure on the top and also sort out the soil stiffness below. Stiffer structure, slab track. So here, let's have a look at the German standards. And again, I'm looking for unmodified ballast. And what I'm doing is generating Rayleigh waves. Generating Rayleigh waves here and just looking at their properties and what they're doing. And we're checking it against the dispersion curve analysis. Assume at the moment that our Young's modulus is just 60 megapascals. Just make that assumption. And what we've done is we compute the critical velocity at about 360 kilometers per hour. Looking at the Rayleigh wave propagation, this is the Rayleigh wave coming through. Looking at the Rayleigh wave propagation, we estimate between 350 to 370. So the analysis is correct in what it's predicting. In terms of the Rayleigh ground wave, this is the profile. And I've normalized this. So this is one Rayleigh wavelength here, depth. One Rayleigh wavelength. So the depth function is normalized to the Rayleigh wavelength and the displacement is normalized to the peak vertical displacement. That shape there is the Rayleigh wave with depth. That is its lateral distribution, but that is the vertical deflection profile from the Rayleigh wave. Notice that when we look at that, the peak displacement is occurring here at about the one quarter wavelength. It is starting to rapidly diminish once you get past about a half, and in fact, once you pass three quarters, it's diminishing very rapidly. This sets the depth of the stabilization that we need to do to solve the critical velocity problem, whether it's for ballasted track or for concrete slab track. Here is the generation of the Rayleigh wave coming through. And what you can see here, this is the Rayleigh wave front moving through. And you can see it quite clearly here as well, but you can also see there's a bit of reflection from the boundaries. But you can see the vibration pattern generated from the Rayleigh wave. And these are the vibration <coughs> patterns after the wave has, has gone through. If I again take a section through that and look in that direction, then there is the Rayleigh wave front propagating through the soil. And I've superimposed to the correct scale the analytical solution for the Rayleigh wave. And we can compare where peak to peak and where reductions are occurring. And it matches quite nicely. We can predict exactly what the depth of stabilization needs to be to give you a critical ratio of whatever value that is required by analyzing the properties of the Rayleigh wave which is generated. Uh, we can do that now for different stabilizations. So here, I've stabilized the upper two meters of the track and looked at, again, what the Rayleigh wave velocity will be. And the bottom one is concrete slab track. So what we've done is to compute what the Rayleigh wave speeds are based on that German one, based on a stiff track stiffness, and based on concrete slab. So here are the Rayleigh waves general going through the track structure. So this is the Rayleigh wave for the 60 megapascals at 360 kilometers per hour, stabilizing the upper two meters with about an extra 40, 50 megapascals, whatever it was, has increased the critical speed to about 395, Putting slab on top has upped it to 445. So again, it's a combination of increasing the upper track stiffness, but also the soil stiffness allows you to look at how you improve um, the critical speeds. Of course, I looked at 60. Now, if we assume 60, bear with me, is the EV2 value, and then we look at what happens. Remember the graph which shows you the shear modulus reducing with shear strength. So if we assume uh, that it's double that, that the actual stiffness is double the 60, then we compute new values of the critical velocity. We're assuming that the 60 megapascals is large strain, and then the small strain values are double that. Let's make that assumption. The critical speed then goes to 507. If we compute it for the German standard, it tells us that once we get to 250, we're at 0.5 of the critical speed. But it's possible that the German site, quoted by Pitter, 
the, the lowest subgrade was not 60, it was actually 45. And I think it was more likely to be 45. Which means that we're actually at 0.6. So it's telling us for the German standard, once the critical ratio had exceeded 0.6 then we were likely to exceed the 20 to 30 millimetres per second on that peak particle velocity. So here's a hypothesis for you. It is possible that if the stiffness values presented in the German standard are adopted, then the unmodified peak particle velocities will exceed the 20 to 30 millimetres when the critical speed exceeds 0 0.5 to 0 0.6. So therefore, and this is a hypothesis because we don't have a lot of the data, the hypothesis is once you reach 300 kilometers per hour, perhaps you should be looking at slab track. And that's the hypothesis. But we don't have all of the data and the peak particle velocity, again, is a function of many things. So it's a starting point of where we go. Conclusions. So I think I'm almost spot on for time. It can be initially postulated that if a German standard are adopted, 20 millimetres per second may be approached. All it means is that you might have slightly more maintenance to do. That's what it means. Modifying pad stiffnesses can reduce the peak particle velocity and allow a higher line speed, but a critical velocity ratio than 0.5 to 0.6 would actually start to make it go the other way. In other words, you put the softer pad in to reduce the peak particle velocities, which means you can run the train faster, other issues aside, but that may then cause the peak particle to start increasing again because the critical ratio is increased. A solution to the problem, of course, is to use a stiffer system because it makes quite a difference to the critical speed. And also, it's a bound system, so you're not going to have the settlement problems that you might get in terms of increased maintenance with ballast. And that was the conclusion that the Chinese researchers came up with was that although even with the slab they started to see a critical speed effect, it actually didn't matter. The settlement of the slab was still absolutely fine. The slab was able to just absorb that vibration, even though the speed was higher. So ground stiffening for critical velocity. Peak ground displacements of the Rayleigh waves occur, occur within one quarter wavelength. They were up here, it's where the peak ones are. And we can see it rapidly diminishes. And it's very easy to calculate the Rayleigh wavelength. <coughs> Uh, for the structure, the code, that code I showed you does it in a day to do that. Sniffing the upper track structure should have a very positive effect. In terms of looking at the settlement of slab, um, we're actually using the Low Corpse project, which is an EPSRC funded project, and we're just about to modify the Graph 2 facility. And as part of Low Corpse, uh, Max Bogle have very kindly offered some slabs that we will be testing at Heriot Watt to look at those settlement characteristics. Thank you.